Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, James Farrell. So James um, was recommended to me by mutual friends. He's really very experienced in the somatic work, over 45 years in the field. So really been, been around a while. Uh, teachers such as Randolph Stone, the founder of Polarity Therapy, Stanley Kellerman will talk about, and his own work is, is named Formative Embodiment. So I'm um, looking forward to getting into this today. Joining us from Barcelona, James, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Great to be here. So let's hear a little bit about your journey. What was the beginning of your journey with the body? Well, it actually started in an unlikely place. My first career was, uh, was actually literature, and I taught literature for a few years. And, um, and in a strange way, that became the foundation for everything that followed. Um, and uh, so I entered the, the body work and uh, the, the whole embodiment uh, field more through a kind of a, a, a humanistic sense than a pure science sense. And then I, I obviously I became interested in the science, but um, I, I entered it through experience uh, the experience of it, the ideas and the principles of it, that's where the, the energy of it reached me. And then I found out that there was a whole scientific background uh, as well. So uh, the first, as I mentioned to you, the first giant that I, that I met was Dr. Randolph Stone, who was a founder of Clarity Therapy. He was an osteopath and a chiropractor. And uh, the first time I heard him, I didn't understand a word he said. But the energy and the, the charisma and the power of mind, just uh, I had never seen it before, even at the university. So that's where I made my shift of career. I just decided to, to follow this for a year or two, and I stayed with it for the last 40. So, so he was, uh, yeah, he was my first great inspiration. And then the second uh, was uh, Stanley Kellerman, uh, who did a, his formative psychology work. And then I have a lot of colleagues who have studied and taught very interesting things, Franklin Sills, who did the cranial biodynamics. Anyway, so I, I dived into the field and after about five or six years where I had doubts about what I had done. You know, I'd left this wonderful university setting. It's like a big park with long vacations and long holidays and and I dived into a field which in those days virtually didn't exist, you know, but I guess the God smiled on me a little bit and, uh, and I stayed with it and it's a wonderful work. I really love it. And, and I think I contribute more to others than I would have by teaching literature. So this is out in the States. Yeah. Yeah. This was all pretty much in California, um, which is where a lot of this stuff happened. And then, and then I moved out, out to the East coast and, uh, practiced and taught in Boston for a while also. Okay. So I was, I'd like to ask you about some of these uh, figures. I mean, you know, Randolph Stone and Kellerman are two kind of big names in this field. I heard a first thought about Randolph Stone through um, Richard Strozzi Heckler. I know it was one of his teachers. Right. And um, as I understand it, his work's kind of like energetic body work. I mean, I, I didn't, haven't ever had a session of polarity therapy, so I'd love right. to hear a bit more about it. Yeah, well, Dr. Stone started out as an osteopath, chiropractor, and naturopath. And, um, and he had a very successful practice in Chicago, but he started to feel there was something missing. And uh, as a result, started, he told me he once did about 14 trips around the world looking for uh, health care systems and healing systems. And he started studying the great traditions. He studied yoga and Ayurveda. He studied Chinese medicine. He studied, uh, you know, whatever he could find. And so polarity therapy ends up being his synthesis of, uh, you know, the hands-on Western traditions and uh, the, the vision that he assimilated from yoga and Ayurveda primarily. And he, he made a very powerful, interesting mix. And um, uh, uh, I think that's, uh, you know, it, at a time before these things became, you know, popular. Um, but his combination of, he, he was both a student of science and a student of the great traditions. Um, and uh, so it's a very uh, potent mix. Uh, uh, around that time, Fritjof Kappa wrote the Tao of Physics. 
and that popularized this kind of blending of Eastern philosophy with Western science, which Dr. Stone was a practitioner of. And I was talking to Shinzen Young about this, a meditation teacher, and he was saying in a grumpy LA in the 50s that this was a very, um, uh, an unusual thing, like now we take it for granted, this met b- blend of East and West and the, the science of mindfulness and the Tao physics or whatever. But this was a weird idea in the 50s and 60s. This wasn't an expected turn of cultural events. No, it was. And, and uh, so within his, you know, his, his uh, tribe were, of course, the osteopaths and the chiropractors. And he was, he was known within that world uh, and... Um, but he never became a, a big within that world. There were the, there were a couple of his colleagues who understood what he was doing um, and uh, and built upon it, like a man named Robert Fulford, you may have heard. Uh, but um, he wasn't discovered until around 1969 in a big way. And one of uh, Richard Strosey's colleagues, uh, Dr. Robert Hall, yep. met Dr. Stone in India and invited him to California. And that's where Dr. Stone got discovered by the alternative community. And from 69 until 73, uh, he started teaching very big classes. uh, And that's when I met him in 1970. And uh, so he, uh, it's true, nobody really knew what this work was. And um, so, um, but, so those of us who started into it in 1970 had a pretty uphill battle. Because uh, in those days, we also didn't have a shingle. You know, I was a chiropractor at that time. And most of my colleagues came in from different fields. Um, and so it took a good 10 years or so before the name started to get out and building a practice was uh, ever more possible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I heard he was quite a character as well. Yeah, and- well, yeah he, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was Austrian, kept it, kept, I spoke in excellent English, but his accent was always there, but he was like a bear of a man. He had, he had fing- his fingers were bigger than my thumb. And when he grabbed you with, all, with as much love as he had, you, you got very quiet. It felt like a bear had grabbed you. And yet he had a, a combination of great power and enormous sensitivity. You know, it was the first time I'd ever had, a, a, in a sense, a kind of a cranial listening session from him. And mm. it, it, just the feeling... Uh, of having him listening sort of seemed to soften my organs. It was a very powerful. He gave me about nine or ten sessions over the time I knew him, and that's what just completely refocused me. And does it have anything in common, that work, with the cranial work that I know you've also been teaching with my, Michael Kern, a mutual friend of ours, and the biodynamic cranial work? I mean, does it have anything in common with that? I mean, just a sensitive kind of work or... Well, Dr. Stone uh, was, as an osteopath, of course, the, the cranial osteopathy was the foundation of biodynamics, too. So he had studied uh, with, uh, with some of the folks who were starting to do uh, the cranial work, the cranial osteopathy, so he knew it. Um, and then Franklin and Michael kind of developed biodynamics um, uh, in, a, in a slightly different way. But, um, yeah, the, the work that Dr. Stone did had a great sensitivity. But what he did, which was different from, for example, biodynamics, what he studied in India was the, something called the three gunas, a Sanskrit term. And basically, he felt that you needed to work in three fundamental ways. You needed to create a lot of space and sensitivity and, and listening. But then he felt that the techniques that were highly stimulating, more rhythmic and, uh, and stroking and so forth, were also very important to kind of stimulate body energies, get things moving. And then he also worked with deep pressure. So one of the differences with the cranial community was that Dr. Stone retained a much wider mm-hmm. range of hands-on possibilities. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'm just getting interested in more hands-on work myself now. You know, I just had a... Uh, Rosen method t- uh, sessions today and a cranial session yesterday. It's uh, as this stuff spreads a bit more to Europe, it becomes a bit more accessible, you know. But um, really a joy to be able to try some things that are not just massage or uh, chiropractors or something. Yeah, right. there's, mm. uh, yeah. There's a great subtlety, depth, and uh, range in the work, and uh, it's one of its interesting elements. Um, and right. Let's talk a little bit now. Um, 
about Kellerman. You know, a lot of people have got his books. And I, if listeners haven't seen Kellerman's artwork, I really recommend just Googling Stanley Kellerman, which is K-E-L-E-M-A-N for November Kellerman. And um, there's some beautiful imagery from his books. And But I'm not sure how many people really get his work. So I'd love to sort of dig into a little bit about what it is. Well, Kellerman is, in, in my money, for my money, just a, a, one of, a giant. He has a certain recognition, but, um, you know, certainly the people in, in the profession know him. But he hasn't perhaps reached the kind of popular, uh, you know, uh, territory that, a lot, that other people maybe with a bit less range have reached, you know, mm-hmm. he's, uh, he has, he, you know, the first time I heard him, which was around 1981, I felt like somebody had just put a, an electric crown on my brain. My brain was almost fritzed out from the concepts and the depth of a vision that he had. And, um, but I think you're right. I think somehow the, the depth of his work, you have to grow, it grows on you. You have to kind of work with it for a while, listen to him, go back to practice uh, to appreciate the range and the subtlety and the elegance of his work. Um, although I think a lot of people, uh, I, I think it is hard to get from reading the books alone, you know, to see him work and have him work on you opens up a whole territory that you just can't read about, which is probably true about a lot of things, of course. You know. Especially in embodied work. Yeah, this is why a podcast about embodiment is slightly ridiculous in some ways, but I hope it at least inspires people to go try things. I'm always at least trying to taste things. Start somewhere. <laughs> and I mean, tell us about some of the basic concepts then from his work in, um, uh, what was the name of his work? Is it formative somatics or? No, he, uh, well, he, Actually, I guess uh, he had a number of names until he found the name that really stuck. And the name, the final name, which I think he's been using for quite a few years, is formative psychology. Uh-huh. Well. Before that, he was calling it somatoeducational uh, work. He never wanted to call it therapy. He wanted to call it uh, much more of a, a deep education or re-educational process. But of course, therapists have latched onto it as well. And um, so. Um, but at the heart of it is this whole idea of formativeness. And formativeness, again, that's one, a concept that's a, it's a very potent concept. And it, it says that what we are doing right at this moment, you and I, our conversation, whatever's happening here has obviously a foundation in form, which goes all the way back to conception at the very least. And so that there is a thread and a formative process that begins conception. And what he says is that the adult is already present in the moment of conception, that there is an intention at that first moment to build a functioning, mature adult. And so if you look at embryology, you really see the best vision of formativeness, right? It's a genetic, biologically organized, formative process to build a body in in nine months and you know saying it like that everybody knows it in a sense but it's an incredibly complex coordinated uh, intelligent process and it forms the foundation of everything that happens afterwards so we are in a continual process of formation so for example just having this conversation you know i mean Obviously, I have a lot of conversations, as do you, but this is a very specific conversation. So I have to, in a way, organize myself, form myself for this moment to interact with you, to interact with the, uh, the technology. And so I have to actually, it, it's not rote. And I have to, in a way, form in, in you know, in simple ways uh, a response to the moment. And of course, this is within, you know, within life, it's a relatively simple moment where I have to organize a form to. But of course, you go outside and you, you have all kinds of experiences which you're not fully prepared for. And, and so then the challenge is to organize a way of behaving, a way of understanding, and a way of thinking such that uh, you can manage the situation, make it work for you and others. And um, so the whole formative process has many layers. It's got a a biological layer, you know, we learn social forms from families and the, and the tribe. 
And then we also start to organize our own personal forms so that we build upon nature, we build upon social form, and then we kind of somehow develop this personal form which expresses us and is more satisfying. And, uh, you know, and I see you, you see me. We're not trying to hide behind, uh, you know, a world of, of uh, uh, forms that don't satisfy us. We had this concept of insults to form as well, didn't we? Right. So, you know, there basically uh, there is a developmental process. If you look at the, the embryo, it, it with, you know, if everything, if the conditions that it develops and go well, it will develop a fully function, a fully functioning and minimally traumatized infant, you know. And as a minimally traumatized infant, it will continue its development, its exploration, um, it's, it's learning language and so forth. And insults to form are uh, normally external forces, which can be prenatal or postnatal or adult, which, which interfere with this trajectory that all of us feel is kind of uh, natural for us. You know, he talks about the fact that each of us has a trajectory, which when we find it, it's very satisfying, and it, it invites us to show more of ourselves. And when that trajectory is, is uh, you know, obstructed or, uh, you know, challenged, then some, we have to, we go through this kind of finding ourselves process and, and, and look for ways to develop behavior that, that is adequate to the situation. So um, I don't know if that's helpful. I'm, I'm trying to sort of get more to grips with it because I've, I've only done a very minimal workshop of someone that had been trained by someone who's trained by someone him. Like, like, can you give us a bit more of a sense of how this might show up? You know, a listener might be a coach. They might be a yoga teacher. How, what, what's the sort of so what here for them? Yeah. Okay. So, so the, the first, you know, it, it is a large territory. So I'm mm. going to see if I can find some very specific pillars, you know. So, um, and try not to be too academic. This is not a, this is just kind of a, and, uh, but, you know, we take something simple like a hand, right? And so basically the hand in every moment has a form. And, and basically the hand can go from extreme contraction, right? Which is a fist. And it can be a fist of ever greater intensity, or it can go the other way and eventually be a, an open hand you know, until we get to the extreme of extension. Well, in that small range, we have a massive amount of emotions, of intentions, right, of preparations for action. And most people take it for granted. And so I have an exercise where I tell people, okay, this is, and I get this from Stanley, you know, make a fist. And so everybody makes a fist. And if you sit with your fist for a moment, you start finding out what kind of fist you made because I didn't tell you what kind of fist. Uh -huh. And some people make a very intense fist that they can't even hold for more than 20, 30 seconds. Right. So they make a, they, they respond to the suggestion or the instruction with a lot of intensity and they overwhelm themselves and they tire themselves out. Mm -hmm. And other people will make a softer fist, which they can sustain for much longer. And other people won't want to make a fist. They want to go the other way. They want to be open. So you begin to see in something as simple as making a fist, a whole range of personal behaviors and forms that each person organizes because of their whole background. Now, that's yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a nice example that people can do. And I just did that now as, I was, you know, as you were talking. And it's like, oh, there's all this stuff opening up there. And, I think there's a principle here, which is very nice for many kinds of embodiment teachers listening, which is you give instructions and assuming they're not too specific, you kind of give p enough space for people's patterns to emerge. Exactly. I, was, I was watching this with some yoga moves the other day. We're just moving our legs, you know, lying on the floor, knees up, moving the knees backwards and forwards like wind windscreen wipers. And some people were going twice as quick as others. And some people were pushing their edge and some people weren't. And, you know, there's some people were enjoying it and some people hadn't even thought of the idea of enjoying it. And even though everyone had the same instructions, you're getting utterly different patterns coming out. And I, this is a, we use this in our leadership work all the time. And it, I think it's just really nice principle that people will reveal their, 
general default form through whatever movement exactly. you give them. You, you see it like it's beautiful. You see it in every moment. People's default form will show up and will condition themselves and the environment based on it. And it's normally pretty unconscious, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then, but then just to kind of finish this. So, so basically what happens is there's a, there is a continuum here, which one can explore. So you see the pattern that the person develops, but then you can see that there is a continuum between the hardest ass fist, which is looking for a fight and Along that continuum, you can move to an open hand, which is a hand of giving, a hand of, right? And, and it's a very small distance, right? And so that there is an infinite number of steps in this continuum, which will organize all kinds of different responses and invitations to the environment. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's a, another one of his concepts is, that people have give, give themselves normally a very small range of responsiveness in these patterns. And by, and there are exercises to explore how you're organized and to begin to give yourself more options and possibilities. Um, and so it's learning our whole range of, yeah, of motion and beginning to appreciate how with very small movements, you can organize very different states, very different emotional experiences, and invite very different relationships. Can you give us another example of an exercise? I find this comes alive for me when I hear the exercise more than the theory so much. Okay, sure. Okay, well, you know, what you can do is you can just start a conversation with somebody. Uh -huh. and you, you know, like anything, you can, you know, it can be the simplest thing like asking, well, what are you here for? What are you really interested in doing today? Or, you know, what's your relationship to mom and dad? Or... You know, um, you know, how is your work going? You can really ask them almost anything. Right. And one of the things, and then most people will start to talk to you, but what they will also do is they will start to show you a whole world of gestures. And that world of gestures contains an enormous amount of information, you know. Now, you know, there's a popular vision of body reading. So we understand body reading and power positions and powerless positions. But there's a whole personal language of a gesture. So, okay, talk to me about your work. Okay, my work, boom. And so immediately there's an organized gesture. And this gesture sums up their relationship to work often much more precisely and deeply than what they're gonna tell you. So for so, listeners you can't see, maybe the hands come forward in a grasping action, maybe they, push away maybe the hands go up in the air so this this is so this is symbolic this is in some way expressing their deep relationship to the idea of their work much deeper than they can talk for 20 minutes and they've they've already shown you what they really mean exactly so sometimes often you can get an essence of their situation in an instant and what we do then is there's a whole procedure Kellerman has what he calls the five step procedure also called the how exercise and so what you do is you, you freeze frame these really significant moments or these significant gestures. So you don't just try to complete them because I know there are therapies or other kinds of work that say, okay, let's, let's see where this wants to take you. Yeah. You actually freeze frame it and you allow the information in that gesture to slowly make its way back up to your cortex and you start to discover elements that you didn't really appreciate before and so we you know there's a whole five-step process in a sense for harvesting the information uh that that emerges out of posture and gesture which i think is where he really his work really shines you know because there are many ways of working with motor activity you know um, but we you know he works with a certain micro kind of micro process and micro steps that are absolutely surprising uh, as to what emerges from there. That's where you really need to experience it to see it. Uh, it, go, it can go very deep because, of course, every gesture is such a complex act. You know, we don't sometimes appreciate how just, you know, a gesture you know, requires so much in terms of not just the nervous system's intentions and organizations, but you support every gesture with your heart. The heart has to support every gesture, however small. 
and your whole metabolism has to support every gesture. So every gesture becomes an avenue towards a kind of an integrated view of how your whole system is is cooperating. So I don't know, that's a little summary of of how to no, take no, I love it. It's made me really curious. I think it's about time I jumped on a plane to Barcelona hearing this. It's made me um, super curious about it. I mean, in your own, your own work in formative embodiment, is it essentially sort of an outgrowth of, of Kellerman's work? I mean, are you combining it with other things? What's the... So, uh, that? I mean, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously my version because, and Stan, you know, Stanley, you know, uh, he appreciated that. He wanted people to take the, his work and use it in their own way. He was very happy with that. But it's, I'd, I'd say the work I do is probably 70%, 75% really built on Kellerman work. And then there's a, a couple of other really critical pieces, which is, uh, which I, I, do, I also learned uh, from both polarity and from biodynamics, which is, uh, which is the, the power of pulsation. Again, that's a term that a lot of people know and use. But um, in biodynamics, of course, they have this concept of the three great tides. And, um, and, and Dr. Stone would talk about the power of pulsation as well. And um, so that because everything, again, that we say, we do, all our, all our actions, all our thoughts are supported by the pulse. It's supported, obviously, by the heart pulse, by the respiratory pulse, by the CSF pulse. And the body has so many different kind of rhythms to it. There is a pulse that's called the pilot wave or the, the, the long tide or the deep pulse, which is kind of the body's metronome, which is a pulse that goes even deeper than any of these physiological pulses and coordinates them. And again, I'm summarizing a lot of experiential material in a, in a short few sentences. But when you begin to experience directly the sense of deep tide, it's a very powerful, it's like that oceanic feeling that people talk about. And Kellerman talks about it too. He calls it a parasympathetic float. And it's kind of a reset of the whole autonomic system of the body, the parasympathetics and the sympathetics and all the stress accumulation in the system in a way have a moment where they can reset. And again, when people experience it, it's almost as if the story they're telling disappears. And they just sit in this kind of oceanic tidal quality. There's nothing mystical about it. I mean, it's a very physiologically experiential process. And it's like deep settling. So a lot of people will talk about settling and quieting and stilling. And I think this takes it to a very, you know, the same impulse, but it takes it to a very deep level. So we work with this whole deep pulse idea, long tide idea. Uh, as a foundation to all the structures that emerge from it. And so what can happen is that somebody is telling you a story that's making them miserable and they're cranky and they're pained and, you know, and if we, if we track them and listen to them in the right way and use the five step process in the right way, we can in a sense support them to making ever greater contact with their own deep pulse. And when that happens, it, it is. It's like a reset, and it resets their physiology, but it also resets their attitude uh, towards what's going on in their lives. Now, of course, there's generally much more to do, but it's a very powerful moment, and I think that's the, when that happens, that's when people get the work, you know. Um, so, um, anyway, that's... Uh, that's, well, that's uh, nice to hear, and, I'm, I'm, you know, what you've been doing this a while, so what... What are some of the things you found really work or really don't work in this field of embodiment for, as, a, as a, if I may say, a veteran in the field? Well, you know, everything works for something. I mean, you know, um, and everything, yeah, I mean, everything will have a certain effect, right? Um, but um, what, I've, what I've found really works, of course, you know, in the interaction with other people, you're, you're, present in a very specific way. I'm sure you're working with these concepts as well. Embodiment has a lot to do with a, a certain vision of presence. And, um, uh, you know, I think what both Kellerman and, and Dr. Stone, what they did for me was they made certain distinctions that were very, very useful, you know, distinctions that go beyond 
much of the popular kinds of ways of thinking about about these things today. For example, embodiment, a lot of people, I talk to a lot of people and I ask them, well, what do you think embodiment is? And they think, well, it's grounding. It's getting in touch with the body in some way. You know, they have certain ideas about it, but they stay a bit, a bit limited. In other words, um, the, uh, the process of embodiment includes grounding, but it goes much beyond grounding. Uh, goes much beyond sensing the body. And um, so one of the things, as you say, that I, I've kind of learned from that is, is that embodiment is lived through the establishment of boundaries, through effective living through our transitions, through taking situations that may be really challenging and literally finding out how you form yourself in them as much as you can to, re- to, to achieve a satisfactory result within them. And we do that anyway, but we often don't do it with a procedure. We don't do it with a, a certain consciousness. So, um, so um, I'm almost forgetting what your initial question is. Oh, I'm, I'm more just curious, you know, you've been around a long while. And um, it's actually my 40th birthday today. And you've actually, according to you, you've been doing this work longer than I've been alive. Um, yeah. I'm thinking, you know what, there just must be a wealth of experience there in terms of um, what you've seen things come and go, different fashions, different ways of working. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you've seen come and go over the years. Well, I, I think what, uh, you know, what, what's also part of the zeitgeist right now is a movement away from catharsis, right? That's been going on. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's been a, a very uh, powerful kind of uh, shift, you know, because I think there's still a lot of people working cathartically. That still holds a lot, you know, because it's, it's so dramatic. And not so many years ago, I uh, you know, probably was more longer than I, I think right now. I sat through a, a weekend with uh, um, Pirakos, who was one of the founders of Bioenergetics, along with uh, Lowen. And uh, he was really working extremely uh, cathartically. And it was about, you know, breaking down uh, armoring and really bringing emotion powerfully to the fore. And it was all about very powerful, interactive and stimulative, uh, um, you know, processes. And so I think one of the big things I've learned is how, you know, how that is not a use, not normally a useful way to go. So that what we work with is a lot much more with slowing things down you know, step by step with a, with a kind of a, a real presence and awareness, slowing it down, making everything smaller, really incorporating pauses, the, the great importance of the pause. Mm, like thought and Christ, you know, that intricative yeah. pause. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Kellerman also, uh, I mean, Fel- Kel- when Kellerman was kind of growing, uh, Feldenkrais was around, Ida Rolf was around, uh, Alexander was around. Al Pesso was around. Um, it's interesting that was a sort of birthplace, the sort of West Coast as a land crucible of the coming together of East and West. And a lot of these body approaches, you know, uh, were, were kind of Feldenkrais was there and these different people. And it's now there's a sort of another generation coming through. And sometimes I see this move to the gentler approaches, which I'd also say are just more intelligent. And then other times I also see the reemergence of catharsis that. Someone was, there's a guy on the internet who's just discovered Alexandra Lowen's work and he's, he's doing camps and because he's like a famous YouTuber who does weightlifting, he's got hundreds of men coming to these camps and part of me is celebrating it. It's like, great, new audience for embodiment, you know, then this guy's popular, he seems coming from the heart. But equally, I can see them making the same mistakes of like huge catharsis and it's the sort of 60s being done again or the um, some of the breath work that's being done now just seems to be, uh, really going back to that 1960s harder, faster, pushes, pushing it more. And it's like that, does, does that lesson have to be learned each generation? It's part of it. Well, I think we, we know that some things do have to be, you know, some things are very much, uh, you know, life stage. Adolescents mm. are going to do crazy things because that's their physiology, right? They're going to be doing stupid things, uh, jumping off uh, balconies when they're drunk in, in Mallorca because they're adolescents or, you know. Yep, done that. that. <laughs> there's, a certain, right, there's a certain learning that comes along with a life stage um, 
uh, that seems to be somewhat inevitable, you know. And then I think uh, the other the other thing that Kalman talks about, which is I think very useful, is uh, the idea of the constitutional types, which you may have heard about the mesomorph mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. and of course, uh, you know, a mesomorph, which is a powerfully mus- muscle muscular uh, uh, individual whose muscles kind of are really running his show. They have a lot of uh, say in how he how he lives his life may have to reach kind of the end point of what somebody can do with power, with force, until he starts to realize that there are limits to doing things with force. And what are the other options and what are the satisfactions, you know? And so, uh, so I think there are contexts that, uh, you know, that I think are very useful in, in seeing why people have to reinvent the wheel, you know? Yeah, yeah. As you say, like there's almost like life stage development stuff, and then there's cultural factors, and you know, there's, there's like this guy, for example, is coming a lot out of modern men's work, which is sort of trying to rediscover masculinity. So they're pushing kind of quite yang approaches, should we say? You know, it's it's congruent with that. And you know, in Europe, I think there's things that will be different because it's not California culturally. And um, I mean, what was your original reason for moving to spain what was the, the barcelona what was the uh, just nicer weather i mean what was what what was the driver there well the, i mean the original reason I, w- I actually really wanted to live in paris for a couple of years my my original fantasy because i was as a literature a student and teacher i i studied particularly people like hemingway and fitzgerald and gertrude stein and that whole crew who the lost generation who lived in paris so i developed the paris fantasy and uh, oh, yeah. And so, so I, you know, living in the States and I, and I really wanted to live that life for a year or two just to kind of see what my, my literary heroes had lived. So that was always in the back of my mind. And then once I was traveling and I met a young man from, a doctor from uh, uh, Barcelona who got interested in the polarity and says, one day I'm going to call you up and invite you to Barcelona. And finally he did. And so I was practicing, I had a practice uh, in, uh, in the Boston area. And I flew out to Barcelona, did a couple classes, and realized, boy, Barcelona's not so far from Paris, you know, and I speak Spanish, so maybe maybe this is not a bad place. And then a few months later, I went back, did some more seminars, and I saw that, wow, there is a market here. And I decided to take a couple of years. I sold my practice in Boston and moved to Barcelona because, and, and a lot of it was because it was close to Paris. Turns out Barcelona was a very much more far, far, far nicer than Paris, far friendlier, far nicer, far better standard of life. Good choice. Yeah, but that's how I ended up there. Okay, okay. And do you, is there much of an embodiment scene now in Barcelona? I know a couple of um, teachers out there, and I know there's a little bit of an embodiment group for a while after the conference. But um, yeah, is there much going on out there? Well, you know, it, uh, I the, the um, I've been my my primary work for the lab for for until about the last three or four years has been polarity and cranial and that whole package and and it includes embodiment but I think what's been happening in the last few years is that the formative embodiment idea has kind of grown for me and what I'm doing is I'm making a very big shift I'm shifting out of the the polarity trainings, which I've done for 40 years, and shifting into formative embodiment because I think it's well, there are a couple of reasons. One, I'm getting to an age where uh, I don't want to do so much physical body work, and uh, you know the polarity trainings are two and a half, three years, and I don't really want to commit now for three year packages. I'm happy to commit for six month packages or something. Mm-hmm. But so and so for many reasons, I'm. Uh, even though this work has engages me in some of the ways that the polarity did, it's a, it's a different focus. And uh, so uh, even though the body is central to it, uh, we're not working on the body in the same way that I did. So, um, so anyway, the, there is a, an active community in Barcelona and um, of, of many different things. So you find, you know, many of the same therapy that, and, and coaching possibilities in Barcelona but it's still you know you know the the it was 1975 I guess when Franco you know left the scene and the church was still very strong 
And so compared to England, compared to Holland, compared to France, compared to many other countries, Spain still has a relatively young therapeutic consciousness. And they're very ready to learn, and there there is sophistication there. But it's, it's still in a kind of a growth mode. And, um, uh, and there isn't the kind of the regula- regulatory world that you have in other countries. So I don't know, that's kind of a roundabout way of saying there is a growing emb- embodiment community. But where I work mostly is, I'm to work, I've, I've been working in Switzerland, I'm working, I want to, I'm you know, to work in some of the northern countries as well, rather than just staying in Spain. Do you find any cultural differences that are interesting when teaching embodiment? That's a bit of a running theme of the podcast. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, well, you know, I mean, I, at this point, I've probably taught in about six different countries. And, uh, and you get a general, you know, there are always individuals who plug right in. But, but um, sure, sure. I mean, you see the resistances in different ways. You know, the Spanish are very tribal in a certain way. Again, you know, uh, I don't want to insult anybody. I'm not, that's not the spirit of it. But there is a certain tribal quality in Spain, which is probably changing somewhat with the new generations, where, you know, what, what you're community members think has a great importance and it does in many places but of course england has its great tradition of eccentrics you know so there's a lot more support in england for doing it's okay to be weird here and it's a very communal culture the spanish i think it's it's yeah. certainly for better and for worse yeah and then switzerland of course is very very correct you know very rule-based rule-bound culture they need the work and and they are open it's a great therapeutic uh, yeah. you know, but, you know, each culture will have its, you know, probably nothing, I, I don't think I can add anything particularly new to that. But, yeah, each country in Spain, in Italy, in Italy, in France, you really do see the, the cultural overlays that, that affect how you can teach. And I taught, I taught for a few years in China, and that was even... even that's more pretty different, different, right? That's, that's pretty different. That was really different, yeah. And uh, they're, they're the, the actually the most doing group I've ever met, you know, the Americans are pretty big doers. Okay. Even more like action orientated, like they, they get wanted, on with it kind of work. They wanted action, you know? And, um, and so I was trying, I was teaching a, a cranial training there and they loved the idea of stillness, <laughs> but they hated to be still. So there was an inherent contradiction, you know? And, um, <laughs> So anyway, things like that, you know, I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes, but I guess that's maybe... Well, culture exists, and I, you know, it's one of the things, because the podcast listenership is so international, and I feel it's one of, some, one of the things that sometimes some of the Americans who haven't lived abroad or traveled like you have a, a little bit blind to, so some of the, it's one of the themes we bring into the podcast that yeah. not everywhere is Northern California. Yeah. So, um, okay, great. Well, this is interesting. Anything you want to say before we start towards any sort of... We've got time. Are there any other topics that we haven't touched upon that you think are kind of central to your work to touch upon? Well, let's see. I mean, sure. I think, you know, I, I, you know, there are topics which everybody has to talk about, you know, I mean, we understand that boundaries, um, you know, are, are kind of a critical topic. Everybody's got to talk about boundaries, transitions, managing transitions. These are, but, you know, it's interesting when you really look at them, not just an, as an establishment of a kind of a barrier or, or whatever, but when you really look at them as four features of a formative process, uh, there's a very nice uh, set of nuances uh, that, that come into play when you start to work with boundaries. And um, Kellerman does a beautiful job of talking about qualities of boundary. You know, I've seen many different ex- boundary exercises but I don't know, I think the most elegant I've seen are some of the things, the ways he, he invites us to work with boundaries, work with transitions, and in the moment, in the act, we really slowly build the kind of person-specific and situation-specific elements that you need in that moment. And so it's very elegant in working with boundaries and transitions, which everybody is dealing with all the time. Yeah. And the idea of how do you organize yourself to meet a situation, you know? And I think we sometimes don't realize how much feedback we are getting at every instant and how much processing is going on. You know, we, 
we also think of feedback as kind of, okay, tell me what you saw. But of course, the body in every instance is taking massive amounts of feedback, uh, particularly if a situation gets heated or something starts to get, something important is generated. And so to begin to listen to levels of feedback that we don't even normally know is there, are there, is uh, and another part of what we work with. So these are all topics that I think everybody will go, yeah, these are important topics. But I think each way of working brings additional elements and deepening and, and nuances to the, you know, the important topics. Well, yeah, I really like the sound of what you do, actually. And I, I, to be honest, I feel this with a lot of guests who come on, but I, I, I do actually feel personally sort of inspired to look you up and where are you going to be doing stuff? Where do, where do people find out about you? You haven't got a huge web presence as yet, I've noticed. No, I haven't. I kind of, I've been, for whatever reason, I haven't. Well, I think, you know, I'm going to be start, I'm going to sh- be start to show up a little bit more in, in uh, London. So I'm going to have an introductory talk there, actually, a couple hours in September, September 11th. Is this okay for me to... Yeah, 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 totally, totally. Well, well this should just... Uh, I'll, I'll try and get it out before September the 11th then. So, um, yeah, we can... It's 27th now. Yeah, we'll get it out in a rush, and it'll be just before then. Great. So I'll have, we'll have a talk there, and then October 5th and 6th, I'm going to be teaching a weekend of this material. So in a weekend, that's when you can really get a, a much fuller sense of uh you know of what we're going to be doing so that also will be in in london uh and um and then after that i'm going to be doing a a, a postgraduate seminar for michael kern uh in january uh, more for cranial practitioners um and uh, that's like in terms of people find this after this takes a lot of people listen to the podcast later on where's the sort of central point on the internet they should be looking for for dates and webinars and seminars and things. Can I give you a, a, an address or what's the best website for them to go to for your work because I'm, I'm i'm seeing one on e-health learning and i'm seeing first uk. what's first first expression is uh, is organizing this phase of the work so w, either www.first-expression.co.uk or the, the, the email for that is just info at first-expression. So the, for this first phase, that's David Haas who, uh, who's organizing it. And then Michael Kern will be coming in in the later phase. Um, so they're kind of co-organizing. So, yeah. and um, uh, Good. Okay, well, I'll be. I'm, I'm, I'm sending my literally sending myself a note now to remind you to. I'll you know, be looking up some dates for next year and things because I'll be full up for those ones. But it looks like interesting stuff. Okay, well, why don't we say the leave it there? Would uh, any final message about the body, Jim, to uh, to finish with? Well, I, I you know I appreciate the opportunity, Mark. Uh, once again, thank you very much for you. Opening, you know your your platform here, and um, just you know that you know. What I appreciate in terms of what you're doing is really opening up a whole community uh, with varied skills, varied approaches, you know, um, to enrich this whole sense of what it means to to live, uh, you know, to have a body in existence. It, we take so much for granted, and as a result, we don't live some of the amazing potential. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it's a it's a wonderful work, and it's great to have a community that that is uh, addressing it in many different ways because each person will need a different kind of stimulation and different kind of uh, uh, processes, you know, so. You know, it's nice to make it available. Today's my 40th birthday. I um, I could have designed today any way I wanted, you know, I make my own schedule, obviously self-employed. And I thought, what do I want to do today? And I thought, I spent the morning with my wife and I had a body work session had lunch with some friends and in the afternoon I've interestingly I've just done the things I normally do like I coached a couple of uh, my mentees while walking around the park and I I thought you know I thought oh should I do a podcast yeah quite fancy doing a podcast on my birthday you know because I like this you know I like talking to interesting embodiment people if you were in Barcelona we'd have a coffee right and I'm on a now for embodied facilitator course which is one of my own offerings seeing my students and then I'll then I'll go out for dinner and I thought it's quite nice to have a life where I would choose to do on my birthday pretty much what I would do on a work day without the emails and the calls to the accountant, you know, pretty much the same thing. 
So it, it just feels like that's a nice um, life that I've managed to find myself in through. Oh, I, I really appreciate you know, having a moment with you on your birthday. That's great. My pleasure. That's what I mean. My pleasure. Okay, Jim, let's leave it there. I've got an EFC call about to start, so I better go check in with those guys. So thank you so much for your time, Jim. Thank you. Bye-bye. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast, and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes, um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites, his comments on there um the facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um yeah i will reply to things personally there so um also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there there's videos there's free ebooks there's ebooks you can buy and of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. OK, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Oof, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Until next time, welcome home to the body.